Ebullient greetings. I'm your host, Jackie Bird of Jackie Bird Spiritual Wellness, your guide to stress and anxiety relief, mindfulness, awareness, self-care, self-love, and personal growth. Welcome and thank you for joining me as we roll with peace in mind. Today's riff is Are You On The Right Train? Riding On The Urge. These episodes feature people who are doing their thing, they follow their heart and their passion, and they create how they want, what they want, when they want. And they are riding on the right train. Today's spotlight is the wonderfully talented artist, painter, and educator. Sonia Sclero. Guys, I, you know, look, you know how this goes. I always go into how geeked up I am about my guests because I love my guests and I love the wisdom and experience that they add and bring to my life and your life. So I am sitting here with my guest, Sonia, and I'm going to have her introduce herself to you and to tell you where she's from. I'm Sonia Sclero. I am an artist, a painter, a professor, and I live and work in New York City. How cool. Now, are you from New York originally? I grew up in Philadelphia, and my mother's side of the family, in fact, was from New York. So I was the only girl growing up in Philadelphia who thought it was Rockefeller Center (laughs) and um, a beauty parlor and... uh, (laughs) I always had New York in my blood. So even though I was in Philadelphia and I loved I loved growing up in Philadelphia, we would visit New York often. And wow. I knew that I was coming to New York. You know, it's always so great in our journeys when things are very clear. Like a lot of times things are not so clear, but to have that clear, I'm coming to New York, I'm doing my thing. You're an artist. Were you always an artist? I have to say that I was always the peculiar girl playing in the dirt, making things. I remember in art class when we were very, you know, I get, it must have been like kindergarten, first grade, all the little kids would make little coil pots. I don't know if you remember that, coil pots or little pinch pots. And I was making noses. Oh. Um, <laughs> So my mom has a whole display of clay noses on her dresser. I was always an artist. There was nothing that we could do about it. I was always playing with little bugs. I was making little houses for the bugs. I was always drawing with markers. I was always building things. I would take um, apple cores and make them into people. I would collect rocks and I would see faces in the rocks. And I would have a collection of rocks that I would play with that had faces on them. I was always making stuff and I was just always an artist. I didn't consider myself an artist though. I just Mm -hmm. had to make stuff. So now are there other artists in your family? And how did your mom feel about this path that was evolving in front of her? Jackie, I don't know if you know this, but my mother was principal ballerina at Pennsylvania Ballet Company in the 60s. No, 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 no. I did not know this. I don't think I told you that. Yes, she was principal in the 60s, danced professionally for a few years until she had an injury. Mm. But the arts was very much a part of my life growing up. Um, Not only dance, but also music, and art and going to museums and theater. So I was really lucky because I got to experience all aspects of the arts. And my mom was my ballet teacher. Oh, um, get out. <laughs> yes, which I don't know if that was the best idea, but she was a, ter- <laughs> she was a terrific teacher. I just really, I wasn't gonna follow in the ballet path, but mm-hmm. because my parents both love the arts, they they always supported my love of creating. That's fabulous. Now, what's your mom's name? That's so cool. Yes, her maiden name was Lupescu, Carol Lupescu. 
when you're a principal dancer, that is the top. You have the core, the ensemble, you have soloists, and then you have the principal dancers. And that is a serious moving up along the food chain. Were you really aware growing up of the rigors of dance in terms of you the know, demands uh, and... No, I didn't really know. I mean, the first time I saw my mom kind of, sort of dance was, I think I picked her up at a class that she was teaching. She was professor at University of the Arts in mm -hmm. um, Philadelphia. And she also taught at the Rock School. And um, I remember, I think I had to pick her up and I caught the tail end of a class and she was demonstrating for her class. And after class, I went, oh, mom, you're so good. <laughs> oh my God, you're so good. And she looked at me like I was crazy, like, what, what? Okay, just get, you know, let's go, let's go. Yeah, so I didn't really know. And of course now we have little videos and we have pictures and I'm very proud, yeah. So you took dance. When did you realize that this wasn't for you? So my mom was uh, trained very traditionally, of course. And I went to her class and then she put me in a class with this, uh, demanding Russian man who kind of oh, yelled at yelled at me. Um, I, I wanted to do my own thing. I couldn't understand why this guy was yelling at me. I wanted to get down on the dance floor and boogie. Oh, wow. <laughs> and then I wanted to <laughs> I wanted to get home and make stuff. So I wish I had kept it up. At least I got a foundation. So I know plie, tendu, passe. But I definitely knew that I was not going to continue in my mother's footsteps. I was very focused, but not, unfortunately, not in dance, in my art. You created art as a wee little person. When did you decide that this is what you were going to do? Well, let's see. In high school, I always did art. My, actually, it was interesting. Um, I was quite a shy girl and my parents knew that I had this special gift. They brought my paintings to a woman who was a PhD art historian who knew about art. And they said, what should we do with this? with this talent and she said whatever you do do not put her in art classes <gasps> wow yes she didn't want me to be intimidated by other kids mm -hmm. or um, she didn't want me to learn how to make she wanted me to just make <laughs> so i love what, that yes so what they did instead was she suggested i work with an art college student who would come to the house and very you know, chill, hang out with me. We go to the park, we draw, she shows me some stuff. And it's just a fun activity. It's not like wow. you have to go to art class now and follow the direction. Uh -huh. And I did that for years. I didn't know that I was learning. I didn't know that I was good. I just made stuff with this gal. And when she would graduate, she would pass me on to a freshman in college. So I worked with these wonderful people for many years. When I got to high school, I remember we had to draw something and hang our work up on the wall. And I must have been in the ninth grade and everybody hung their work up on the wall. And I, I thought there was some kind of, it was like a practical joke or something. No one had done their best and they were, I, I don't know, I, I, I hung my stuff up and I looked at everybody else's and I was like, what's going on here? My work was, it stood out. <laughs> yeah. Um, from then on, I, I knew that I, had this talent and I I worked very hard. My parents sent me to um, real art classes in college. I studied at the university, uh, what was it called? It was called the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. And also um, it was called PCA at the time, Philadelphia College of Art, which is now University Arts. And I studied anatomy and color theory and oh, drawing okay. and painting. And that's when in high school, I really got a wonderful education. Then it was time to go to college. My father was very much against me going to art school. Mm -hmm. He thought that I was never going to be able to make a living. And he wanted me to go to a nice liberal arts college. And maybe there I would meet a nice Jewish pre-med husband. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, yeah. So. I think after a lot of convincing, we realized that I was going to have to go to art school. And I went to RISD, Rhode Island School of Design, 
My father was okay with that because it's right next to Brown, which is Ivy League, right. which, you know, maybe I could take classes there or maybe meet my nice Jewish pre-med husband. Did not, that didn't happen. So I went off to college and I did art for four years. It was a remarkable experience, an unbelievable experience. And then I graduated and moved right to New York because that was the goal, to move yeah. right to New York. I moved to New York and I had a degree in making pretty pictures. Wow. That does not get you a very good job. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I actually found a job working, let's see, it was at Saks Fifth Avenue. I, I found wow. that I was gonna be a creative, a creative entrepreneur. That's what I thought I was going to be. And I was the, administrative assistant to the director of special projects in the division of corporate visual merchandising at Saks Fifth Avenue. Whoa. <laughs> oh. Yes, it, it really was. I wore pantyhose and uh, suits and I wrote up purchase orders and went to meetings and got my boss's dry cleaning. <laughs> oh boy. How did that make you feel? You know, I would go home on the subway every day and cry. And I felt like my fingernails were itching because I needed to make stuff. And I was sitting in an office and I felt like my soul was crumbling. Yeah, I can dig that. So how long did you do that job? Well, let's see, it must have been about a year. I remember my professor at um, RISD called me up and said, I'm leading an artist group in Maine. It was a plein air painting program. And he said, come for a week and we'll paint outside. Just leave your job and come paint with me. And I did. I left my job for a week in the summer. They let you go? I mean, they were cool with that? I think I had vacation days or something. And I went and I painted for a week with my professor, who I think he knew I was crumbling. Right. And I painted for a week, realized that, oh yeah, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Right. Oh yes. So I think I came back, I went home to my parents and I said, I need to make stuff. Mm -hmm. What can we do about this? Mm -hmm. And um, I ended up quitting my job. They gave me enough support for six months so I could get a studio in New York. I got this crummy little studio in Tribeca and um, I would go to uh, figure drawing sessions at the Art Students League just to keep up the process mm -hmm. and keep my skills up. And I started to paint in this little studio. Yeah. Wow. That, wow. I bless your parents for, for being yes. the support. And what would you say to people that have the burning desire to pursue whatever it is they want to pursue, but they don't have the resources. Well, the thing that I've realized by watching my creative friends is that people always have excuses. Like, I don't have the space, I don't have the time, I don't have the energy, I don't have the right paintbrush, I don't have, you know, they make up any excuses. But for me, I try to make stuff no matter where I am, no matter what material I have. I can, I don't, it doesn't matter if I have the perfect studio space. You know, I, I signed up for the Art Students League because it was just a place to make stuff mm -hmm. while I was looking for a studio space. So I would tell people that if they have this desire to just just go with what they have, even if it's marker and, and paper. Like you said, in terms of making excuses, I don't have this, I don't have the money, I don't have the time to flip the switch. What do you have? And this is regardless of whatever it is that you do. What do you have? What do you have access to? And if the answer is still nothing, then change it. Change that answer. Research, get on Google. If you don't have a computer, go to a library. If the library is on the other side of town, go to the other side of town. If you don't have the money to go, walk. Whatever it is to satisfy that desire, it sounds to me, Sonia, that if you did not do what your calling was, you would have bust. Yes, I think I was on my way down. I mean, I remember standing in the subway, holding onto a pole with a tissue in my, you know, just like sobbing. Oh. And <laughs> after I was going home from a day at the office and, um, you know, 
I just couldn't help it. And I think this man came up to me and said, you know, it's, it's going to be okay, you know. <laughs> but I knew that something, I mean, I was at the breaking point after, I remember my, my office didn't have any windows and I, I didn't, I was like, what am I doing here? So the excuses that I hear people make about changing their life or doing something creative. I remember I talked to one woman who said, oh, I would love to paint, but I just don't have the time to go to the art supply store. It's like, you don't have to go to the art supply store. What do you have at home? Just take whatever you have. That urge to create, for me, it was an itch that I had to scratch. Mm -hmm. So your parents help you for six months. You get the studio in Tribeca. Now I'm going to guess that Tribeca wasn't Tribeca as it is now. Tribeca was <laughs> what no. it used to look like. So you're in this kind of shabby rundown area. You're doing your thing. Were you able to begin to earn a living before those six months were up? Well, what happened was I shared my studio with a bunch of other people who had come in and out. And one of the women looked at my work. She was painting in one corner and I was in the other corner. <laughs> we were all just there making our stuff. It sounds crazy, but we just, that's what we had to do. And she said to me, oh, you have to, you have to submit your work to the juried show. It was some juried show down the street. And I had no idea what that was. I think it was nearing the end of my six months where I had to figure something out. And right now everything is online. You apply to juried exhibitions through websites and things like that. But this was, you had to bring physical pieces to a gallery. And I think I brought three little paintings. It was a small works juried exhibition at NYU. I don't think they have it anymore, but I brought these little paintings over and I, you know, submitted them. And I guess I, I won, I won. <laughs> I don't know what wow. Like I, this is crazy. One of my paintings was chosen for the exhibition. And I think I got like a, maybe a gold star or I don't know, something, a recognition. And I remember I invited my, my parents and my family and my friends all to see this little painting hanging on the wall. And it was a big opening where other artists would meet each other. And a young man, very well dressed, came up to me at one point at the opening. And he said to me, excuse me, I'm a curator um, an independent curator and I curate shows around the city and I was wondering is this your piece yes it's my piece he said I'm wondering if you have more of these and he's in front of me and my father is behind him and I'm looking at my dad because I'm thinking my dad must have paid this man <laughs> to say this to make me feel better you know and I'm looking at my dad going what come on dad would, would you stop and my dad's going I don't know him. Oh, I don't know that's him. That's a scene in a movie. <laughs> exactly. So I said to him, yes, I do have more pieces in my studio. Would you like to come? So he came and he selected 20 to 30 pieces for this oh huge show. Oh my. <laughs> and and it, it, it sold. It did, it did wow. well. <laughs> oh. And that was amazing. It was amazing. So I, I worked with this gentleman. He put me in some beautiful shows around the city. And from there, it kind of snowballed. I met other people, other curators, other galleries. And I'm not saying it all happened wonderfully in six months, mm -hmm. but that was the beginning. And it was the path, the start of this path to where I am now. And I remember my dad's face saying, I don't know him. And he was kind of like, what's going on here? <laughs> and I'm happening? like, what's going on here? Yeah. So it was, it was amazing. First of all, I have chills hearing the story. It's so beautiful and such a testament to what is possible. And I think that what happens to us, especially as we get older and we get kind of jaded, it's important to hear these types of stories because we get bombarded with so many things that are horrible in this world. And we tend to lose faith and hope because we are so immersed in all of the negativity that's occurring. But I tell people that as much negativity is occurring, there's that much more positivity that's occurring. And to listen to 
stories and people and bios and read people's biographies and memoirs to see that when things look like they're not possible, the answer is yes, it is possible. And you have to follow your gut. You have to follow your gut. So how cool you get in the studio and you end up sharing your space. Now what's funny about what you were doing is now these things are called share spaces. You were doing that before it had a title where you had, <laughs> you know, the, you yeah. were sharing your space. I was, I was like a, um, I was a pioneer and I, I didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I think? If you are really a pioneer, you're not going to know it in to some degree because you're just doing you. If you right. have this ego thing of I'm going to be a pioneer, well, you know, right. okay, fine. You know, there are people that do that too. It sounds to me that you very much have operated from a place of authenticity in honoring your, your calling and what you're urged to do. I saw on your Instagram that you had a painting and you were standing next to, hello, Rachel Ray. How did that come about? How I met Rachel, she's absolutely delightful. I have to tell you that. So I had over the years, I've been lucky that I've had shows around the world and I've met a lot of amazing creative people and some high profile people. A lot of different individuals love my work, which I feel, I feel honored and um, I'm so happy that my work touches people's different emotions. So I have a wonderful connection and a collector and a friend. His name is Harlan Coben. He's a very prominent mystery writer and a lot of his books are made into Netflix original series. He's, yeah, he does a lot of like creepy, spooky, spooky books. I've read a bunch of them. And um, he's collected my works over the years. He actually wrote the preface to my book. Oh, I have to send you my book. Yes, I have a book of some of my paintings. And so this past holiday season during the pandemic, he contacted me because he fell in love with a couple of paintings that I had done. And he said, I have to give a gift. Do you have anything? And I showed him some of the stuff that I had available. And he picked out a piece and it turned out that it was a gift for Rachel mm. and she loved it. I think she was very touched by it and we met that way and she's loved a lot of my pieces and I loved a lot of her food <laughs> and I'm really lucky. <laughs> I, I really, I'm so lucky because I, through my art, I've gotten to meet so many fascinating people. It's this wonderful connection. Yeah, it's really, it's incredible. I have not done anything in listening to you but smile. I am so uplifted and inspired by hearing your story and, or some of your story. <laughs> you know, and when I saw that photo of you standing next to Rachel Ray with your painting, I went, oh my gosh, that's just absolutely so incredibly awesome. Over this past year, you have been doing a series on this pandemic. Can you talk about that a little bit? Right, right. Yes. So let's see. I was working hard in my studio and then, uh-oh, beginning of March last year hit. And I was not, I did not feel comfortable getting down to my studio. So I have an apartment in Midtown. I live there with my husband and two kids. And suddenly we were stuck in the apartment all together and I couldn't get to my oasis, my paradise, which is my studio. So I set up my studio in our living room. <laughs> <laughs> so my husband's Zooming where he projects his voice because he has to do that. I don't know why. And he's on his Zoom calls and my kids are miserable on their in their Zoom, you know, school. And I'm painting at my easel in the apartment. And the paintings that I started to do in the living room were nothing like I had ever done before. I had begun to experiment a bit before the pandemic. I had sort of a, a creative breakthrough mm -hmm. and I started to do something with like much more color, much more vibrant, more abstract dealing with a lot more feeling, emotion, tapping more into my imagination. Mm -hmm. But these paintings that I was doing in the apartment 
were about my dreams, about my wishes, about my fantasies, dancing on the roof, meditating, swimming in the East River, going to Coney Island, riding on the merry-go-round that takes off into the sky, kind of wild imagery that I had that just would appear in my head. And I painted like crazy uh, during that time. And those were the paintings that started to really speak to people because it turned out that a lot of people were feeling very similarly. And even the titles of my paintings before the title was um, Cityscape with Umbrella (laughs) (laughs) or um, Houston and Broadway Right. In the rain. Right. You know, right. Um, this was I, one of my paintings was called I Dreamt Last Night That We Danced on the Rooftop at Twilight. Another title was I Went to Coney Island Yesterday, but I didn't go to Coney Island. It was in my imagination. And I remember I posted that painting on Instagram and someone said, did you practice social distancing when you were there? Oh, you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no, honey, it was in my imagination. I can do whatever I want when I go to Coney Island there. Yeah, hello. So from there, that was sort of the the pandemic was, you know, of course it was brutal. Just lockdown was beyond, beyond. And that's the other thing. I had friends who were going through, of course, excruciating times during lockdown in New York. It was uh, no words, you know. And I heard people who, of course, they couldn't work. They had creative blocks. They didn't know what to do. And I just I just needed to make stuff as usual and get it out. Mm-hmm. And the colors that I was using became much more vivid. And even the imagery. There was one painting I did called, Is Anybody Else Having Vivid Dreams? Mm-hmm. And my dreams were so vivid. I was, there was a fish and there was a dragon and there was a, some crazy clown head, you know? Um, and the responses I got were, well, yes, yes, I am. So it was a crazy time, but for me, it was, I just had to create and get it out. And the time that I have now where it's still, you know, it's still going on. Yes. Of course, it's so much better. I feel like I'm continuing the series, but it's, the work is, there's, it's more joyful. You are on the faculty of Parsons, is that correct? Yes, that's right. How did that appointment come around? Well, okay, I'll tell you. Actually, no, I don't think anybody's ever asked me that. So I was a graduate student at Parsons and there was a, uh, some kind of, fellowship where you could apply and get a teaching assistantship position. You had to write an essay and then you would win the the fellowship. Yes, I did not get it. I think my essay was way too long and I just, I didn't get it. But I thought, I really do have a lot to offer and I think I would be a wonderful teacher. So what I did was I went to, I think I went to the head of continuing education and I said, I will teach a class for free. (laughs) Yes. I said, I'll teach a class for free. And and he said, but we don't have any classrooms. And I said, that's okay because the class I'm going to teach is outside. (laughs) So I taught for free just to get in the system. Mm -hmm. I taught a, um, a sketchbook class where we would go to a different location in New York and I would teach perspective and space and line quality and shadow and light. And I would choose different places. Like we went to the pond, the sailboat pond at Central Park, I remember. Oh, it's a great place to draw. We went to Grand Central, Bryant Park. I took them all over and it was an optional class. So it wasn't for credit. So sometimes I just have one or two students and I just wanted to, I wanted to get familiar with teaching and I wanted to get in in the system. And by the time I graduated, they had, they offered me a, um, a real class. I love that. Yes, yes. Wow. So I always think like we talked before, you know, you have excuses. Someone says, no, 
And I always found that in New York, or maybe it's everywhere, what does no really mean? Does no mean maybe? <laughs> does no mean maybe you go around the other way? So I was, I was pretty upset, pretty devastated that I didn't get that teaching assistantship because I really thought I deserved it. And when I was rejected, I thought, there's got to be another way. That's the, uh, that what if question. You know, it's like you always have to go, what if, what if I, and then you fill in the rest of that. What if I, if I try this, what if I go this way to me? No, I always feel, okay, you told me no. Somebody's going to tell me yes, eventually. So I just keep going until I get my yeses. Yes. It's definitely recognizing, I would say your power, but recognizing your tenacity and recognizing your willpower, understanding and tapping into that, and not being so attached to outcomes in the sense of it has to go exactly like this. Because when you do it that way, you block anything else that can come to you. There has to be a sense of openness also, where it may not look exactly the way you paint it in your mind, no pun intended, but it will be grander. Now, I wanna go back for a minute you mentioned that you have a, a book of paintings. Oh yes. It's actually, let's see, it's a book of my paintings. I call them my classic cityscapes. I'm actually thinking about making a new book of my pandemic series. The book that I have right now that was uh, the, the preface by Harlan Coben. It's really, it's really a wonderful book. That was done a few years ago and I feel like I've I've grown and my work has become more, uh, let's see, it's become more personal. Mm. It's not just about, it's not just about observing the city anymore and observing the places where I am, but it's more about how I feel about the place that I live and how I feel internally, as opposed to observing what is in front of me. Wow. So that's why I'd like to, I'm thinking about I'll, I'll keep you updated because Jeez. I'm thinking about doing a, maybe a pandemic painting series book. I have a large body of work that I'd like to share. Um, yes, on, I do post it on Instagram and I may have a little show in the fall in New York that is okay. uh, to be determined. Okay. So I will keep you updated on that as well. Okay, people can keep up with you. I have my website, soniasklaroff.com. During the pandemic, I continued to post on Instagram because that was a wonderful way to just post a picture with a, with a title, hashtag, hashtag, mm -hmm. it was out. But I also found that there were other platforms where there were some people who weren't on Instagram and I really wanted to get my work out. So I, for the first time I joined Facebook, I know I'm 20 years too late, um, but I did join Facebook and then I did join Twitter and where else? I think those were the only ones, uh, but I, I mostly am on Instagram posting every couple of days, some new work or sketches or a shot of me in the studio. Oh yes, and I also, my daughter showed me how to do TikTok. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> yes. Yes. So Look but I worlds. I um yeah, so TikTok is uh I have some paintings on TikTok, but I'm not really familiar with the medium, so I'm still getting used to that. <laughs> but my website and Instagram might be the best way to to find me. And Sonia Sklaroff on Instagram as well? Yep, Sonia Sklaroff on Instagram and soniasklaroff.com on my website. And guys, in the show descriptions, that's where you will find her linked. You and I met in a dance class. Yes. <laughs> yeah, a wonderful, wonderful dance class. You are an amazing instructor. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Guys, if you are familiar with dance, you might have heard of Sue Samuels. Sue Samuels is a legend in the dance world, the jazz dance world. She is just an extraordinary human being on top of being an extraordinary teacher. And I've had the honor over the years of being her sub, sub substitute. Whenever she was away, she'd call me to go in and teach. And if you are subbing for someone in a dance studio, most of the time, maybe one person will show up because they are loyal to 
<laughs> the person whose class that is, and it's really tough going in as a sub for uh, well-known dance teachers, and they, especially if they don't know you. And what has always been so wonderful is whenever I've taught for Sue, her regulars come. And that's how I we We someone. adore you. We oh, adore thank you. you. I, that, I, but that's so beautiful. That's just, again, such an honor because, you know, it's tough to go in and sub and sub for somebody who's so beloved. Well, you know, the other thing I wanted to say was, and I think that that's why you and I are on kind of the same wavelength, dance, art, theater, literature, everything is connected. I have such a respect for all, all creative people, all professional creative people. And when you come in and teach your class, I'm so impressed how knowledgeable you are with your craft and how you're able to express it and teach it to everybody else and make us feel comfortable too. Oh, thank you. Without judgment. Well, you know, just in my own journey as an instructor, as someone who was a professional dancer, professional singer, actress, there's terms that you come to, at least I had to, in terms of what I expected when I stepped into a classroom. And over the years, I realized that it needs to be fun. The process needs to be fun. It needs to be fun for the people taking the class and it needs to be fun for me. When I got to that point in my life, it just changed everything. Whether I was the sub or whether it was my class, it just changed everything. You know, at the the heart of my podcast, it is finding what sings, allowing it to sing through you and to enjoy your life. I know that there's a lot of people struggling, but I think that if we can, no matter where we are in life, decide that we are going to look for things that make us sing, look for things that make us happy. And that is the beginning of making it manifest. But you have to have a decision of this is what I want and this is what I'm going to have. And then the universe, God, Allah, whomever you believe in makes that possible. You know, I think again to you, having that studio in Tribeca and this woman saying to you, you need to get juried. You know, she followed an instinct within her to say that to you. And when we do that, when we follow our instincts, it just sets off a chain of these amazing synchronicities, possibilities, all of that. And again, listening to you and your journey, oh my gosh, is so inspiring. And I thank you so incredibly much for spending some time with us. Yeah, you're welcome. It's been, um, you've asked some wonderful questions. I guess I think that um, the key is really no always means maybe. That's a, that's a, <laughs> that's a oh boy. If folks, if you take nothing else away from this time, please keep that in, in the forefront of your mind. Oh, and I have, I know there was one other thing I want to ask you before I let you go, of uh, because it's been on my mind so much, this thing of aging, because as I have um, matured in life, it's an interesting thing as I observe the elders and I observe the ones that are coming up after me, I call my age group the elders in training. Awilda Rivera <laughs> did a shout out on Facebook to the amazing singer Dee Dee Bridgewater on her 70th birthday. And she didn't say 70 years old, she said the 70th level. I the love 70th that. The 70th level. Yes, yes, I love that. What are some of your thoughts on levels? Hmm. You know, I have been thinking about this. Oh, wow so much because this is my 50th level <laughs> and something happened when I turned 50 this year I just decided I mean every, everything just changed for me I I knew that it was going to happen and then I turned 50 and I felt like it's my chance to listen to my gut Absolutely, listen to my gut and not be afraid oh. to say no. It took me till my 50th level to realize that mm -hmm. I've been working on it. 
through my 20s, 30s, 40s. But now I'm enjoying saying, no, no, no. And there are so many wonderful opportunities that are now coming along that I can say yes to because I'm saying no to the things that don't feel right to me. So many more wonderful, joyous opportunities are coming my way because I'm pushing aside the stuff that doesn't feel right to me and making room for that path. I'm thinking about that so much right now. The 50th level approached and it's here. I was dreading it, but it feels very powerful and very true. And I feel like I am, what was the word you used? I can be authentic. Yes. Thank you so very much for the wisdom girl and happy 50th level yes great <laughs> oh thank it's you glorious. yes Enjoy it. thank you thank you for these wonderful questions and i think you're fabulous i hope that you enjoyed that and was thoroughly thoroughly inspired and uplifted by what you heard if you are in a situation currently that is unfulfilling to you, be it a job or a career you've been pursuing, and you feel like there's something else that you really want to do or you already know what that is, get quiet. Sit still, breathe in and out deeply, and begin to envision what that is that you wish to create. And remember, there's nothing too big. It's only small ideas. Think big and write that down. What is it that you wish to create? Write it down, put it in your phone, speak it out loud to people that are supportive of you and go for it, go for it. Don't delay, start now, even if you plot in your mind what your escape plan is going to be, but go for it. This life is meant to be lived to the fullest. Take advantage, no matter what is happening in your life, Right now, there can always be room to create more. Thank you so much for listening. Please remember to visit JackieBirdSpiritualWellness.com. Join my mailing list. I have audiobooks, guided meditation videos, and audio and meditation music, everything for inspiration and to help you relieve stress, increase your mindfulness and awareness and presence. And remember to always roll with peace in mind.